sometimes like substitution therapy. But uh, anyway, that's a whole hours-long discussion. No, no, it's an interesting topic. I have a much more draconian view of weakness because I was raised that way. Am I all wrong that being tough on addicts may be part of the solution? Why is everything so touchy-feely that, you know, treatment and this and that? All right, I'm sure it has a, a role. How about plain old toughness? Well, toughness works to a certain degree. The, the problem with toughness is, is that most people uh, don't understand that addiction only affects about 10% of the population. So if you got the genes for addiction, you're really kind of messed up in terms of uh, the under, having people understand why it is that you became an addict in the first place. There's tons of people. Well, let me intervene with a question. You're a treatment doctor, and I respect what you do. I am not a treatment doctor. I know almost nothing about it. However, I've been around drugs my whole life, ever since high school. They were everywhere around me. Some of my friends became drug addicts, very few of them. Most did not. How do you explain it? All of us had similar personalities with, in one way or another. That's number one. So you say there's a genetic component. I would say there are other components as well. But let's look around the world for a minute and try to be rational. Which nation on earth has the lowest rate of drug addiction in the world and why? I think we have to start from the top. Why would a nation that probably executes drug dealers have the lowest rate of drug addiction? It's, it's pretty evident why. Because people are afraid to deal drugs to begin with. And my, I, have a, I have a daughter that lives in Singapore, and, uh, you know, again, if you deal drugs there, you get executed. And so there's not a lot of drugs on the streets, and I definitely, I don't have any problems with that as far as getting drugs off the streets. I think that would be a great idea. The thing is, is that if you can keep people from using in the first place, then you don't have to worry about the gene being uh, uh, manifest. So there's a lot of people who, like I said, never become addicts because they're not exposed to the drugs, which is a great thing. But for people who do get exposed to the drugs, and we're exposing people at younger ages and more and more, then you see more addiction because, again, out of the 10% of the people that carry the gene, uh, the more you expose them to the drug, the more likely you are to have more addicts. Why do you think that New Hampshire has such a high percentage of drug addicts proportionate to the population? It wasn't like that a long time ago. How did New Hampshire become a, a nation of drug, a, a state with such a high rate of drug addiction, do you think? Just, I mean, again, people, uh, you know, uh, birds of a feather flock together. And so people, when, where there are people, where there are places that it's permissive, then more people go there to use and more people that are using, the more people get addicted. Hmm. All right, doctor, I admire your work enormously. Somebody has to do it, and it's not a pretty thing to do every day, it's just as I admire ER doctors. I mean, one of my favorite shows is, uh, I don't know, the channel in your neighborhood to watch. I watch it at night. There's ER room shows now from all over the country, Boston ER, New York ER, and the things that they deal with that come through the emergency room, the gunshots, the mangled bodies, it's hard to believe that they have the calmness of uh, mind to see a body come in so broken up and rationally go about fixing it, it amazes me that there are still people on the earth who are so skilled. To me, they're all uh, in a class by themselves. So I do respect people who are on the front lines of drug addiction as well as any other a traumatic a aspect of our society. And speaking of mangled, I, I wrote an interesting quip last night. I woke up laughing in bed after listening to uh, whatever her name was, Beyonce singing... Who sang the Star Spangled Banner? Was that other one? That other? Ugh. I don't. I, I think she's one of the most hideous creatures on the planet. So I wrote, we went from the Star Spangled Banner to the Star Mangled Banner in one generation. I woke up laughing. The dog thought I was crazy. I'll be back in a minute. Attention, people of the Jewish faith listening to the show who think Bernie Sanders is your friend. Because an article came out today by Adam Credo of the Washington Free Beacon that you better pay careful attention to. He is the most dangerous of all the candidates. Amongst all of them, the reason he is loved by the university crowd is because they hate Israel. Meet Bernie Sanders, Israel-hating advisors. Democratic presidential candidate, the communist Bernie Sanders, has tapped several critics of Israel to advise him on foreign policy, including one who has compared Israelis to Nazis, and accused them of waging a holocaust. Old Bernie, who is Jewish, 
and had family members slaughtered during the Holocaust, recently disclosed that his top foreign policy advisors include J Street, a Middle East advocacy group that backs some of Congress's most vocal critics of Israel, including, including James Zogby, an Israel detractor who heads the Arab American Institute. If you'd like to read more about these leading anti-Israel apologists for terrorism, if you'd like to read more about Bernie's association with these extremist groups, you will understand why he is so dangerous to all Americans and into the West in particular. And you can read about it on michaelsavage.com, which links up the Washington Free Beacon article. It's an extremely important article that you must read before you join the Bernie bandwagon like sheeple going to their slaughter. Now let's go to some of the callers on the issue of why is there such drug addiction in New Hampshire, where Bernie's motto is live, live free, get high. I am listened to on three stations in New Hampshire, EZS, CCM, GAW, Laconia, Manchester, Southern New Hampshire uh, coming in out of Boston. What is it like on the ground? We've also talked about why I, Michael Savage, am not a socialist, even though I was brought up in a menu, I would say rather leftist menu in New York City. Immigrant son, everyone was poor. Most of them uh, always voted Democrat. To then, you know, Democrat then was their friend. A, a Republican was their enemy. They didn't know any better. And you say, well, nothing's really changed. Has it really not changed? You're, you're still poor? How is it that so many people have moved up in society and they're millionaires and billionaires, how come they still carry the politics of their youth with them? How is it that Hollywood is filled with these people? I, I can never understand it. Well, I can understand it of all people. I know why the, the, the Spielbergs, Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, Ratzenbergs, why they continue to espouse this. It has nothing to do with their real political beliefs. It's because they get away with so much in their lives, in their professional life, producing movies that should be banned most. The violence, the sex, the constant hopping on violence and sex. Every movie there's a gun, every movie there's a heroin needle, every movie someone is uh, having sex with a kangaroo. And you wonder why they like left-wing leaders, because they will never stop them from promoting that filth. So then, on top of it all, they get tax credits in Hollywood. That's number two. And number three, most of them don't pay their fair share of taxes. So the best way to do that is while you're a billionaire, what you do is you make believe that you're one of the poor and down with the people, and you go out with the Black Lives Matter and you give the fist bump salute like you're down with the people. And then you march arm in arm on Sunset Boulevard. And the next day, you're you, you driv driven home in your, in your little car, and you go into your 50-room your mansion somewhere in Beverly Hills, and you laugh all the way to the Swiss bank as your, G, as your G6 takes you to your yacht in the Mediterranean so you, you can continue your communist philosophy. That's all. So you wonder why so many people are cynical, and I count myself as one of them. Well, the results are about the same. You're not going to hear anything different. No matter what you may hear, this and that, the horse race is this, the horse race is that, it's over already. Sanders wins in New Hampshire. Trump wins, wins in New Hampshire. On to the Carolinas. That's all. What more do you need to hear? Every second. Oh, we have the latest breaking news. He's ahead by a nose. He's ahead by a foot. One hair fell out of a Bernie's foot. It looks like Hillary's coming up for the rear. Although she fell over like Humpty Dumpty. Humpty can never do Humpty. Oh, come on already. Can we get this over with? Can someone just declare all the primaries? Can we skip the primaries and get to an election, let's say, in March? Will that ever happen? Can we just vote for the president March 31st? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7287-SAVAGE. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. From the Star Spangled Banner to the Star Mangled Banner in one generation, you're listening to the, uh, Lady Gag her, 
at the Super Bowl the other day. I never got to it. But Lady Gagger is not one of my favorites, not because of any reason in particular. I just don't like Lady, I don't like Lady Gagger's work. But uh, did she really mangle the Star Spangled Banner as badly as we feared? No. Trump rips Mexico. The wall just got higher. He keeps it up. He's going to win. Trump the savage. Maybe Obama doesn't want to. What? What did he say yesterday on the show? Trump the savage. Maybe Obama doesn't want to defeat ISIS. That's a pretty big statement, by the way. And uh, he said it's radical Islamic terrorism, and we have a president who won't even use the words. If you don't use the words, you're never going to get rid of the problem. Maybe he doesn't want to get rid of the problem, Trump said to Savage. I don't know exactly what's going on. He knows what's going on. Turning to the New Hampshire primary, Savage noted Trump, who leads by as many as 21 points in the latest polls, is way ahead of the pack. Trump replied, yeah, so far. A surprise, Savage asked. You're not even saying you're going to win? I don't want to really say it because I don't want to bring any bad luck, Trump said. I'm doing well. The polls look good. The enthusiasm is incredible. And so now looking at what's actually going on as opposed to what we thought, he's way ahead. Uh, and uh, he's going to win, no doubt, a huge victory. It's like a landslide in plain English. Does it really mean he's going to win the election? Gut feeling tells me yes, incidentally. My, my, my instinct, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, I don't even bet on a ball game, nothing. The Democrats are in such disarray. She is unelectable. He's unelectable. Any Republican would make a safer president for the country, and most, most independents know that now. And despite all of the attacks on Trump, he keeps going up in polls. So how do you explain that? How do you explain that he keeps going up? They attack him left and right every day. This, the Trump said that. Trump used this word. Bad boy said that word. It goes up. Why? You can figure out why. So we're looking at the horse race. The numbers are about the same all day. No matter what you do, when they're coming in, they're going out. They're the pitchforks and the overalls. They're coming out. They're going in. This poll and that poll, this district, that district. And a pig goes into the poll. That comes out. 600-pound pig shows up in New Hampshire polling place. I don't know what that's about. Hillary is uh, really finished here. I don't know where she gets the guts to go on, given that she's so despised. The fact is that no one likes her except people working for her and, and a few people hanging around there. But... The young don't like her. They like, like the commie more than her. And most people are so fatigued from the whole situation, they don't care who, who wins. They just want it over. If Karl Marx ran, they would say, I'll do a deal with you. If Karl Marx could win tomorrow, I'll take Karl Marx over the election because I can't take another day of this. They don't even know who Karl Marx is, but they'd rather have Karl Marx win tomorrow if they could have the election tomorrow so they get on with their lives already. There's not even a ball game to look forward to anymore. The, the football's over. Now the baseball begins, then the, the basketball begins, the knuckleball, and the knuckleheads watch the knuckleball. You want to talk about any of this? I'm talking fundamentally about the um, heroin addiction in uh, New Hampshire, because I think it's a serious problem. What causes it? We've touched on that. I touched today on why I am not a socialist, having grown up in a left-wing environment of immigrants, how did I not become one of them is the, is the question. There's a big, big story there. I, I didn't even develop it, truthfully. Now, here's an interesting article from Robert Rector of the Heritage Institution. When Maine required childless adults to work to get food stamps, guess what happened? When Maine required adults without children to go to work to get food stamps, guess what happened? Did you know the number of food stamp recipients has risen dramatically from 17.2 million Americans in 2000 to 46 million in 2015? Obama, as you all know, gives out food stamps the way they used to give out little bottles of cherry whiskey in Chicago to get people to the polls. Costs of food stamps have soared over the same period, from 20 billion in 2000 to 83 bill in 2014. The most rapid growth in the food stamp caseload in recent years has been among able-bodied adults without dependents. What's an able-bodied adult without a dependent? These are work-capable adults between the ages of 18 and 49 who do not have children or other dependents to support, but they're still on food stamps. Now, in the first three months after Maine's work policy went into effect, its caseload of able-bodied adults without dependents plummeted by 80% from 13,000 recipients to 2,600 in March of 2015. 
This rapid drop in welfare dependence has a historical precedent. When work requirements were established in the aid to family